loves me and all that and I just bawled my eyes out and I said this is enough um, I'm not going to hang out with men like this anymore um, because all it's going to do is I'm going to end up in jail and I can't be with the man anyway you know and I can't take care of my son so I knew when I got out of jail and rehab that I would have to change my life and I didn't know how but I knew that they were going to put me through a rehab and the rehab started me down the 12 step uh, 12 steps of recovery for Narcotics Anonymous and they have meetings that I could go to and I got a sponsor that would work with me so and and once the sponsor told me um, that I could borrow their God and fire my God because my God didn't work and I was like that's brilliant so I <laughs> fired my God and I borrowed hers until I could get one of my own that's one of their sayings and I think that's the most brilliant thing that they do in the 12-step recovery program is having other addicts help heal other addicts and giving them a spiritual path if they don't have one of their own. Yeah, wow, what a story. And it really is about coming to a point where you start being conscious of what's actually going on, right? I mean, we just live so many years just doing the, the way that it's always been done in our families and, and reacting and then all of a sudden, you know, it's like, well, how do I actually change this? You know, it's um, it's such an important moment in our lives. And Mark, can you give us a, an insight into what was happening for you growing up? Yeah, my household was somewhat similar in that my dad also could get into a rage. And, um, and in fact, I also became hypervigilant. And I'd also be listening for those steps. <laughs> I could totally relate to that. Yeah, and it's funny because even though I've done a lot of work, um, you know, if there's like a noise at night, like outside our RV, you know, I'll be like, what was that? You know, it's like, there's still remnants in the body and I'm like 64 years old now and I've done tons of work, but there's just like, you know, I can still get startled, you know, mm. from that background. Um, for me, um, I kind of took that as a, uh, you know, obviously we all want to be safe. So I decided I needed to learn how to be safe in the world. So one of the things I ended up studying was literally all the dangerous things in the world. You know, like where is it likely to be dangerous in an earthquake? or tornado? What are all the poisonous plants and animals and snakes? And it's like, I literally studied all the dangers in the world so I'd know what to avoid and how to deal with things. Mm. And I also eventually learned, now my earlier background, um, partly because of what happened with my family, but also some bullying that went on in the school, is I kind of became a hermit especially in like intermediate school and part of high school and I really didn't want to be around people at all and in fact I even had this sense I remember as a kid that I felt like you know we had one of those glass coffee tables and I almost felt like you know if I could just like roll into a ball under the coffee table and say to the world like leave me alone I'd be good you know so mm -hmm. So for me, it's been like a lifelong process of coming out. And now, you know, we've had lots and lots of trainings, both of us. In fact, when we met, we found out we had like five or six major trainings the same, which I'd never met anybody like that. And some of them teach you how to be with other people, even if they're like angry, for example. So, you know, now I have no problems being with people whatsoever, you know, because of all the techniques that I've learned. But it's been a long process of, you know, figuring all this out and learning this. Yeah. And yeah. And it's interesting, isn't it? I, I feel like most people have a degree of trauma, you know, from growing up and 
it's just as simple as having one person in your family that can't regulate their own emotions mm -hmm. that just changes everything for their kids you know and just just that hyper vigilance and i totally and utterly relate to that a hundred percent right um but the relationships we see around us as kids you know our parents that really does become like a, a model for us so <laughs> Lynetta, Lynetta yeah. with your parents what what was being essentially how was love modeled to you as a child mm. well my dad would tease he would play these little games and tease and um, he was kind of rough in his play, so he would do Indian burns, he would tickle me until it was painful, you know. But to me, that was my dad, like, when I would go tell my mom that uh, that hurt, and she'd say, Ron, stop, and, you know, and then I would go back to him, and she said, well, you keep going back to him because he wouldn't stop he just kept playing that way he was rough you know and mm. and she said well you must like it eventually she told me you must like it so then I was like oh okay I guess I like it mm. <laughs> and then I got that I uh, I liked the attention so whether I whether it was good attention or bad attention I was getting attention um, so I didn't want him to stop playing with me and he'd say well if you're going to be a poor sport then I'm not going to play with you so I had to make a decision. I decided to, okay, I'll learn how to, to be with the way he plays and, you know, take the teasing and the sarcasm and, and then um, to be, to be, uh, to get, now the only way it seemed like I could get into my mom's world was with food. She loved food. Um, or clothes and going shopping and, and buying clothes. So those were the ways that I felt a com you know some camaraderie. How do you say com camaraderie? Com yeah. Camaraderie with her is to is to go shopping with her and get clothes or through food bonding. So those mm. those were the ways. Also, she you know going to the Kingdom Hall was something she wanted us to go into the church was important to her so all of us would go three times a week and she um she took comfort in that and I could feel that so I found the ways to to really um make have my mom I wanted her to be happy so I did my best to be good in that religion and um you know I bake I was the baker so I made the fudge and the brownies and cakes and and everybody and here and hearing everyone enjoy the food that I made was one way that I felt loved and you know so and and I also enjoyed that my mom made these beautiful clothes and she bought me beautiful clothes so and when I was depressed she would take me shopping so I took it that love was food shopping going to this church and getting teased and played with rough by my dad yeah, it's so interesting when you see how, you know, what happens to us, just the way that love's shown. And, and your dad, you know, that was probably the only way that he could connect with you, I suppose. You know, because yeah. a lot of men, especially in days gone by, they weren't able to show their emotion in any way. They don't say, I love you and, and hug you gently. It's like, well, I, you know, I need to do something <laughs> to connect with you. So I'm just going to kind of, bash you around a little bit yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. torture's good yeah, yeah. <laughs> interesting yeah. isn't it yeah and mark yeah. mark what was going on in your family that you sort of took as as love yeah uh, actually before we get to that i want to elaborate on mm. one thing lynetta said the way her dad played these games with her regarding touch in particular could you just elaborate on that because I, I want to talk just for a moment okay yeah. there was this touch <laughs> game that he would do he'd say we're gonna do the soft touch game so he showed me you just touch really soft and whoever touches the softest wins so he touched me real soft and then I would touch him 